Hey everyone, I think we'll just go ahead and get started here. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Laura, can you hear me okay? Fantastic. All right, so um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today we're going to be talking about sexually transmitted infections, not the most glamorous uh, topic in emergency medicine, not trauma resuscitation or critically ill patients, but kind of something that we're going to see on a daily basis. And you could easily see something like this at uh, any of the sites we work at. Um, big thanks to Dr. Laura Price, obviously, for helping me kind of with the topic and all of our help so far. And I think we're also fortunate enough to be joined by Dr. Lise Bondi and Megan Devlin from uh, Infectious Disease today. And I think Dr. Michael Payne from Microbiology is also going to join us a little bit later. Um, I think he had a, a meeting that he had to kind of go to, but um, hopefully he's here for the second uh, uh, second half. I see Dr. Devlin there on, on screen, so thanks for coming. Uh, certainly, if there's any questions from anybody um, or any comments from anybody, uh, please feel free to just kind of chime in. I can't see the uh, text box, so just uh, feel free to unmute and kind of jump in. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for some questions and we have these experts here from their fields and um, we can kind of pick their brains uh, at the end. All right, so to start, uh, we're gonna be talking about the two kind of big STIs that we're gonna see in the emergency department, chlamydia and gonorrhea, they're by far the most common. Um, we'll briefly talk about the microbiology and epidemiology of uh, both of them. And then uh, we'll touch on kind of the clinical features that I think most of us will be familiar with. Um, testing options came to the forefront when we ran out of urine containers recently and seemed to raise a lot of questions. So we'll take a look at kind of the testing options available to us in the emergency department and uh, what the guidelines say. And then finally, uh, the recent CDC uh, updated guidelines are something that we're going to focus on and see whether or not there's something that we should be adopting into our practice in the eMERGE. Uh, we'll do a quick review of syphilis. I don't think there's anything new or groundbreaking with syphilis, but uh, I think it's worth a review. It's on the uh, rise in our community. Um, and then we'll just briefly talk about some follow-up and community resources that we can uh, have for our patients. Uh, so chlamydia to start, it's going to be the most common STI that we see caused by gram-negative uh, intracellular bacteria. Uh, so chlamydia is a genus of, uh, of bacteria and the species chlamydia trachomatis is actually what causes chlamydia when we think about it. Um, but there's a couple other species of chlamydia like chlamydia pneumonia and chlamydia cetacea that uh, are also pathogenic to humans, but they cause more respiratory viruses and um, uh, cetacea causes psittacosis or parrot fever. Um, here in Canada and the rest of kind of the developed world, chlamydia is a, a urogenital uh, infection. But uh, something I didn't realize uh, before making these rounds is that uh, uh, chlamydia trachomatis is actually the leading cause of infectious blindness kind of in the developing world and, and places with uh, poor kind of interpersonal hygiene and access to clean water. You get the development of these trachoma here, uh, which causes uh, scarring of the upper eyelid, involution of the uh, eyelashes. And so every time you blink, you basically start scarring down your cornea and it becomes a pacified essentially. Um, and this is the basis for a lot of WHO community uh, uh, mass community treatment programs for uh, tr uh, trachoma, um, where they kind of give um, mass community treatments with azithromycin, which will come up uh, a bit later in the talk. Now, chlamydia has a bit of an atypical life cycle in that uh, its infectious uh, entities, these elementary bodies, are not replicative, and it has to kind of undergo a change intracellularly to a reticulate uh, body. Um, that can then replicate in the cell. Um, and then these have to kind of change back to their infectious entities um, before uh, being lysed and being able to cause uh, symptoms. Uh, this causes a slightly longer incubation period uh, before symptoms begin compared to uh, something like gonorrhea. And the bacteria preferentially affect uh, epithelial, uh, uh, columnar epithelial cells, um, which explains a lot of the areas of infection, such as the uh, uh, cervix, urethra, uh, uh, pharynx, uh, conjunctiva, and uh, uh, vaginal uh, tissues. In contrast, gonorrhea is caused by the gram-negative diplococci uh, Neisseria gonorrhea, um, and also is, uh, preferentially affects uh, epithelial cells. And this is probably a gram stain that we should be aware of just because it uh, you know, can cause things like uh, septic joint and we can get it back in, uh, in taps that we do. And this is data from uh, the Public Health Ontario website looking at the incidence of uh, uh, chlamydia in our communities. With Ontario there in the green and uh, 
our own uh, health unit in the blue. And you can see that uh, over the last kind of 10 or so years, there's been a pretty steady uh, rise in incidents. And again, the same uh, data here presented uh, for gonorrhea, a much lower incidence uh, compared to chlamydia, but again, um, a fairly consistent uh, increase. And this data is from uh, 2018 presented by the CDC that shows uh, the age breakdown for both males and females of uh, chlamydia. And what you'll notice is that uh, uh, unsurprisingly, these are infections that are most common in a younger population, kind of peaking around 20 to 25 years old. Um, and that it uh, tends to have a higher incidence in, uh, in females. Worth mentioning here that uh, um, both chlamydia and gonorrhea have very high asymptomatic uh, rates with some studies even citing up to 70 to 80% of females being asymptomatic for infection. Um, but females are often screened more than uh, uh, men as well. So it can account for some of the increased incidence. Gonorrhea shows a similar age distribution, but a more uh, equal uh, male-female split. And some of the uh, uh, some of the thoughts about why uh, males have a bit of a higher incidence than females is that uh, there's an increased uh, rise in incidence among the men who have sex with men population uh, with uh, gonorrhea, and uh, gonorrhea also causes a uh, much more symptomatic uh, urethritis than chlamydia, which would seek uh, which would have men uh, seek uh, treatment more frequently. This is the data from the CDC that shows the gonorrhea incidence among specific populations. And you can see the quite uh, uh, significant increase in incidence among the men who have sex with men uh, uh, population. Uh, the clinical features of these infections, I think a lot of us will be familiar with, at least the, the main ones. Um, uh, keeping in mind that both males and females can be either minimally symptomatic or completely asymptomatic, and it's probably more common to be asymptomatic, uh, if anything. Males will typically have a urethritis with uh, a dysuria and uh, penile discharge, but epididymitis, as we'll take a look at later, is also a common presentation for, uh, for these infections. And um, patients with uh, um, epididymitis are often treated empirically for uh, uh, sexually transmitted infections, especially when they're under 35. Females can have a bit of a more uh, uh, varied presentation. Um, and uh, cystitis or cervicitis, I mean, uh, is probably the more uh, common. But obviously, the development of pelvic inflammatory disease and its acute and chronic uh, complications is one of our bigger, uh, uh, bigger concerns with these infections in, uh, in females. Uh, and both, uh, both sexes can get uh, pharyngitis, conjunctivitis, uh, proctitis is also uh, something that we probably don't think a whole lot about, but um, uh, is uh, certainly a concern. And uh, gonorrhea can develop into a disseminated uh, infection. Uh, it's not listed here, but uh, in children, specifically neonates, uh, these are uh, can be quite serious infections um, uh, passed from the mother to the uh, infant uh, uh, during birth, and you know cause things like uh, neonatal conjunctivitis. So if you see a patient with symptoms in keeping with one of these infections, is there a way to tell the difference? You know, do they have chlamydia, do they have gonorrhea? And the answer is no. Um, you can't really differentiate which one is which based off historical or physical clues. Um, and that's why we not only test for both, but we also often treat empirically for both. Um, not only do their symptoms overlap, but they also often uh, kind of co-infect each other. And I think there's a lot of people out there um, uh, Googling onomatopoeia right now, like uh, Dr. Bryce had to do. So before we talk about um, how to test, we'll just take a look at the public health recommendations on who we should be testing. And this is just a, uh, a nice kind of flow diagram that the Public Health Ontario website uh, has available to anybody. Um, there's not really any big surprises here. Uh, uh, patients should be screened for chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis if they have signs or symptoms of either, uh, kind of unsurprisingly. If they have uh, risk factors for an STI with an exposure, or simply if the patient uh, just requests screening following exposure. Um, and you can see kind of at the bottom of the screen there, um, uh, the different testing methods that uh, um, public health would recommend. But we'll take a closer look at these in a minute. Now, a little more nuanced is when do we perform a rectal or pharyngeal uh, swab on our patients in the emergency department? And uh, 
you first you have to obviously have an exposure at either a rectal or pharyngeal site, and then you have to fall into kind of one of these higher risk categories. So men who have sex with men, or if the patient is engaged in uh, sex work in the community, um, or if they have symptoms of a, a rectal or pharyngeal infection, then you can offer them uh, swabbing at those locations. But um, otherwise, rectal or pharyngeal swabbing is not uh, uh, routinely uh, recommended unless the patient is very high risk. So now we'll take a look at the testing options available to us. Um, and like I mentioned, when we ran out of our uh, urine containers for our male, uh, uh, well, for all patients, but specifically for our male patients, um, uh, this seemed to raise a lot of questions. So we'll take a closer look at kind of what uh, the guidelines recommend. And this is uh, data that's uh, published by the Hologic Optima 2 uh, manufacturers, and that's the assay that uh, public health uses to run the samples that we send them, uh, specifically through a nucleic acid amplification test. And all the uh, NAT tests tend to have a very high specificity. It's uh, rare to get a uh, false positive with these tests. And it's really the sensitivity that uh, uh, comes under scrutiny, um, especially for a test like this. Uh, this is uh, data for uh, male samples, and you can see that uh, males, we can either test through a urethral swab or a, uh, or a urine sample. And that uh, both these tests perform very well. You know, you try to get over the magic kind of 95% uh, sensitivity for a test like this, and uh, uh, either a urine swab or a, uh, sorry, either a urethral swab or a urine sample achieves that. And so I think uh, either are a reasonable option, but um, considering things like patient preference and simplicity, I think we all reasonably opt for uh, testing male patients with a uh, urine sample. A first catch urine sample specifically. Now things get a little more complex with uh, female patients. There's a lot more uh, ways to uh, to test these patients, um, and public health will run patient uh, uh, patient samples uh, from you know, these areas: uh, a urine and endocervical swab, or a patient collected vaginal swab, or a physician collected vaginal swab. And highlighted here is the reported sensitivity of uh, female urine samples specifically. And you can see that both of them fall under that 95% uh, um, level that we want for a test like this. Um, and kind of preparing for these rounds and looking at some of the literature, even these are quite uh, high numbers compared to what uh, we would typically see in some other studies um, with sensitivity of uh, female urine samples kind of being down into the 80%. Um, one study quoted that the female urine sample may miss one in 11 or one in 12 uh, infections. So it's something to keep in mind. Now, interestingly highlighted here, um, we see that patient collected vaginal swabs perform just as well, if not better than uh, either uh, physician collected vaginal swabs or physician collected endocervical swabs uh, for both uh, uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea uh, testing. And similar data is presented here from a, a New England Journal article that uh, was a review citing a uh, meta-analysis on the topic for chlamydia screening uh, specifically. Their data here is uh, specific to chlamydia, but again, you can see that a, a, a patient-collected vaginal swab um, outperforms or um, is equivalent to the other uh, testing methods um, available. Brendan, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to, I was just following the chat here and there's a couple of oh, questions. Oh, yeah, sorry, I can't see the chat uh, box. No, that's okay. Uh, but I just figured it's timely to ask now then wait till the end. There's just two sure. questions. One is the urine sensitivity for um, the chlamydia gonorrhea that's based on morning samples, like first? Yeah, so these are all first sample? catch uh, urine samples. That's how um, uh, Optima uh, okay. recommends it's done. Sorry, and the other catch yeah. doesn't mean morning, uh, just to clarify that. Are yeah, I'll, I have a slide on that. Actually, ah. We will talk about that. Okay. And the other question is a similar one that I had. Do we have patient collected vaginal swabs in London? Because I was trying to do that the other day at St. Joe's and the lab was like, no go. So just curious yeah, if Dr. Devlin has anything on it. Yeah, so you probably noticed that if you, um, if you, and I'll, I'll talk about this uh, in a minute, but if you try to okay. uh, put the order in as, uh, you know, when you do a swab, you have to put the, the site that you collect it from. Um, a vaginal swab is not an option, but uh, we'll kind of talk about that. Anything else, Corey? Sorry, I can't actually see the chat box, but thanks uh, for- No, thank you. Me. Thanks, that's good. 
Um, so yeah, there's a couple of reasons that are postulated, like uh, especially when I mentioned this to some people, why would a vaginal swab perform better than an endocervical uh, swab? And I have one of the kind of Optima unisex uh, swab kits here that we use um, in the emergency department, um, obviously like strictly for these rounds. Um, and if you look at the instructions, uh, it says that you should be swabbing the endocervical area for at least 10 to 30 seconds. Um, and I doubt very much any of us are doing that, especially for a full, uh, full 30 seconds, you know, count out 30 seconds in your head and it's a, a long time to be, kind of be doing a swab. Um, the packaging also says that you should rotate it uh, clockwise specifically. Um, so if you've been doing counterclockwise, then I guess shame on you. Um, the other thing is that uh, a lot of physicians are not using the second swab or the first swab that is in here to remove the uh, endocervical mucus. And that mucus is very high in antibodies, and it's actually the endocervical um, uh, kind of epithelial area that you want to uh, be swabbing specifically. Um, and then secondly, uh, some patients might not have cervical infection. And if you're doing an endocervical swab, you might be missing uh, vulvovaginal or um, uh, urethral infections. And like Gory was saying, we unfortunately do not have access to um, uh, vaginal swabs at LHSC. Um, this unisex swab kit is not approved for um, uh, vaginal swabs. It can be used for pharyngeal, rectal, um, uh, urethral, and endocervical swabbing, but um, is not uh, approved uh, for use through public health uh, in that way. And I think Dr. Bondi, we've, uh, we, she mentioned in an email that they've been trying kind of through their infectious disease clinic um, to get access to these swabs. And I think that kind of got put on, uh, on the back burner, especially with, uh, with COVID. Um, I don't know if Dr. Bondi or Dr. Devlin uh, want to uh, chime in now, or we can discuss this at the end, kind of what, uh, what's in store for LHSC moving forward. Um, I don't think Dr. Payne is here from microbiology to um, share kind of his perspective, um, but he should be here at the end. And so maybe it's a discussion that we can have uh, down the road. Uh, so in summary, um, males, again, kind of dealer's choice, urine, NAT uh, is probably the most reasonable option considering patient preference and simplicity, but a urethral swab uh, performs uh, just as well. Um, and for females, uh, all the guidelines recommend that a vaginal swab, either a physician collected or patient collected uh, vaginal swab is a first line option um, with an endocervical swab also uh, performing uh, just as well. But if we're going to be doing endocervical swabs, which is really the only thing we have access to at this point um, for females, um, in terms of first line options, we need to make sure that we're using uh, the proper technique. Um, and we can offer urine tests to females, but it is a second line option. And they should be aware that uh, it has a lower sensitivity and may miss uh, uh, some infections. And then Laura alluded to this um, a couple of minutes ago, but when we're doing urine samples, they are specifically first catch urine samples. And that sometimes raises some confusion for um, people of all levels of training. What is a first catch uh, uh, urine sample? And it does not mean the first, uh, the first void of the day. It means patients should not void for at least one to two hours prior to specimen collection, but then they should be catching kind of the first initial part of the, uh, of the stream. Um, now, these instructions are in contrast. Oh, sorry, I should also mention that uh, females shouldn't be uh, uh, kind of cleansing the area before providing a sample. And these are in contrast to what we would say for uh, a midstream urine collection when we're concerned about cystitis. Um, in cystitis, we're obviously trying to avoid contamination with urethral or uh, vulvovaginal bacteria. Um, but when testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, that's specifically the kind of uh, areas that we want to test. And if you're collecting a midstream urine, um, uh, that kind of bacterial load may have been washed out um, uh, by the time you collect the midstream portion. And these instructions uh, apply to male patients as well. And so this is something that should be clarified with patients uh, because a lot of patients will be getting urine samples from triage or um, you know, you'll put in a UA plus this. Um, and if uh, patients are collecting midstream urines, it's going to affect our sensitivity. So now that we've talked about kind of how to properly test uh, patients for chlamydia and gonorrhea, we'll take a look at the um, uh, CDC guidelines and the recommendations of uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada. For patients with chlamydia only, um, this is probably something that we 
we'll see less uh, when gonorrhea has been ruled out by an appropriate NAT test. Both guidelines uh, say that a single dose of azithromycin or a week of doxycycline is equivalent and both are uh, appropriate options for these patients. The real only time we'd see something like this is if a patient kind of came back on the discrepancy list and uh, you know had their positive chlamydia swab but a negative gonorrhea swab and we could offer them treatment at that point. And this has been studied uh, in the literature. This is a meta-analysis from 2014 comparing the uh, um, uh, efficacy for a microbiological cure of uh, either regimen. Um, I think there was 23 studies with around 2,000 patients uh, com uh, uh, total um, and compared those two regimens that uh, were listed above. And this is the forest plot that the uh, uh, authors included in their paper and gives a bit of a visual representation of the uh, degree of uh, uh, change. Now, in this paper, the authors concluded that there was a 1.6 to 2.7% uh, increased efficacy in doxycycline over azithromycin, uh, but the implications of that really aren't clear, and even the authors uh, um, admit that and are hesitant to draw any clear conclusions uh, from it. They cite considerable limitations to the quality of evidence. You can see a lot of old studies back to 1990 were included. Um, when things like culture were the, the test of uh, uh, choice. And they also cite that both treatments have a 95% or greater efficacy uh, anyway, which is what we want in a, a treatment option and what the WHO would recommend for something like this. Um, I, it's, hi, it's Megan. I just hi, Megan. would add to that uh, some of the comments around this, and you may touch on this, is, is about adherence. Um, and so because azithromycin is a one-time dose, and if you have concerns about your patient being able to um, adhere to a seven-day course, um, then often we will choose azithromycin. Um, but if you think that they are, are reliable and will be able to take the seven-day course of doxycycline, then we sort of err on the side of doxycycline. Yeah, thanks, Megan. It's interesting to hear what, um, what you guys do. I'll definitely be touching on that. Um, in the eMERGE, our patients are all very trustworthy, um, so I never have any uh, any questions about their ability to, you know, adhere to medications. Um, and these are the guidelines, uh, how the two guidelines compare for gonorrhea-only treatment. Again, this is when somebody has a negative uh, chlamydia swab and is probably coming back on the you know, discrepancy list uh, for treatment. And this is where the guidelines uh, diverge. Um, the new uh, uh, CDC guidelines suggest that a higher dose of ceftriaxone as a single agent uh, be used for the treatment of gonorrhea, where um, the old regimen and kind of what I think we're all familiar with is that um, a single dose of 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone and a dose of azithromycin um, uh, be used. And to try to understand the rationale uh, for this, we kind of go back to when the newer guidelines were created back in kind of 2012 and 2013. And that's when ceftriaxone really took over as the, uh, the 250 milligram dose specifically took over as the first line uh, treatment for uh, gonorrhea, as you can see there. And at that time, it was recommended that uh, the dose of azithromycin be uh, added to ceftriaxone to try to combat what was then a threat of uh, a rising concern for cephalosporin resistance. Um, and then essentially you had two antibiotics with different mechanisms of action to try to uh, combat that. And this is uh, data published uh, by the CDC on their kind of uh, gonococcal um, uh, surveillance program. And uh, you can see here that the uh, resistance to azithromycin has been gradually on the rise, but thankfully the resistance uh, to uh, cephalosporins and specifically ceftriaxone uh, remains quite low. And so the CDC concluded in their new 2020 update that uh, although um, dual drug therapy with different mechanisms of action might have mitigated uh, emergence of reduced susceptibility to ceftriaxone, um, concerns regarding potential harm to the microbiome, the effect on other pathogens diminishes the uh, benefits of maintaining dual therapy as the uh, recommended treatment. Ultimately, I think they're acknowledging that ceftriaxone resistance remains very low. Um, and single coverage with a higher dose should be sufficient uh, enough to try to combat this. And here are the uh, resistance uh, data um, for Canada. Uh, um, Dr. Michael Payne was kind enough to forward us this. And you can see a similar trend with increasing azithromycin resistance for gonorrhea. 
but a low uh, resistance for cephalosporins. Um, and what we probably care most about is ceftriaxone specifically. And then where things diverge even more is uh, that the CDC now recommends uh, what the CDC would recommend for dual kind of empiric uh, coverage for these infections. And this is probably what we're going to be doing mostly in the emergency department is covering our patients for both um, before getting the results of a swab back. And the CDC is recommending the higher dose of ceftriaxone plus a full week of uh, doxycycline instead of uh, uh, the one tablet of azithromycin that I think we're all kind of more used to, uh, uh, to using. And in their paper um, that they released with the update, they cited a few uh, concerns as the rationale for why they are recommending the week of doxy rather than the single dose of azithromycin. Um, they cite uh, uh, data from children that were receiving twice yearly azithromycin and their gut um, uh, kind of uh, microbiome had increased macrolide and non-macrolide uh, resistance patterns. They also cited that increased azithromycin resistance was found in communities that were receiving uh, mass azithromycin treatments. Um, this was a study out of uh, uh, Niger. And um, uh, like I, I mentioned, uh, uh, some communities are on mass azithromycin treatments. And then the CDC also mentions that azithromycin resistance is uh, also a concern for other sexually transmitted uh, bacteria, such as mycoplasma genitalium. Now, you read through their guidelines and I'm not completely convinced. Um, you know, the, the first point is more of a generality on talking about uh, um, antibiotic resistance in children that are receiving uh, twice yearly azithromycin. And the second point is a study out of Niger again, uh, you know, community mass treatment with azithromycin and the increased resistance uh, uh, patterns there. Um, so while I think the concern is there regarding the widespread use of azithromycin, um, I think we really need to take a serious look as to whether or not these guidelines help us answer the question as to what is the best way to empirically treat our patients, um, uh, knowing that we're going to be using a higher dose of ceftriaxone to treat gonorrhea. Um, so in summary, those are the two guidelines that are available to us at the top. Um, and preparing for these rounds and kind of going through them, I do think the higher dose of ceftriaxone is uh, reasonable. In looking at the CDC recommendations, the concern for increasing resistance to azithromycin um, and the high susceptibility to ceftriaxone, um, as well as the benefits of things like single coverage versus dual coverage, um, I think make this a reasonable change. Um, I think it carries little in the way of increased risk to our patients. Obviously, a higher IM uh, dose of ceftriaxone um, is the drawback, uh, but could also mitigate the effects of PO. Uh, um, antibiotics, uh, uh, like the GI side effects of that. Now, when we're talking about doxycycline versus azithromycin, like Dr. Devlin mentioned, I think we really need to weigh um, the risk benefit as to um, which way we should be going. We've established that there is maybe a marginal benefit of doxycycline uh, over azithromycin for the treatment of chlamydia. Um, but Dr. Devlin mentioned that this needs to be weighed against things like uh, uh, patient preference the cytopec profiles of either of those antibiotics and the ability of our patients to both afford a prescription, um, to go out and get a prescription filled, and then to adhere to um, a week's worth of uh, BID uh, dosing. So I think there is a little bit of caution there um, when we're going to think about giving people a week's worth of doxy over a, a single dose of azithromycin. So regardless of what regimen is chosen, we should be providing good discharge instructions for our patients. Um, they should be instructed to be abstinent for one week post-treatment or when their course of doxy finishes. And then it's recommended that uh, especially high-risk patients be rescreened um, in three to six months. Something that's come up a couple of times is do patients need to get a test of cure? Do they need to uh, be retested after they finish treatment? And uh, generally they do not, but uh, the um, indications for a test of cure are listed there. Uh, things like suboptimal patient compliance. Um, if you're using an alternative regimen, I haven't talked about any of the alternative regimens just in the interest of time, uh, but if you're using kind of second or third line treatment regimens or in patients that are prepubertal, peripubertal, or uh, uh, pregnant, they should all be referred for a test of cure. And that happens usually around three, uh, three weeks following uh, uh, treatment. 
We'll talk about some of the other manifestations of these infections and some of the complications you can get. Uh, pelvic inflammatory disease is uh, a bit of a nebulous diagnosis for us in the emergency department sometimes, and I think probably goes uh, um, undiagnosed or missed a fair amount. Um, an infection of the upper genital tract in females and um, can be caused by a variety of uh, um, uh, uh, bacteria listed there. And this is the table from Rosen's that lists uh, some of the diagnostic criteria. And this uh, table shows up in the other guidelines as well. Um, and you can see you don't need a whole lot in order to start down a presumptive diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, the additional criteria help add accuracy to the diagnosis, but are not necessary. Um, and it's obvious, you know, it can be glaring in the face if a patient comes in with fever and uh, pelvic pain and vaginal discharge. But sometimes the symptoms are much more subtle, such as subacute pelvic discomfort, uh, dyspareunia, um, abnormal vaginal bleeding, or even vaginal spotting, um, and lower urinary tract symptoms. So I think we need to maintain a high index of suspicion for this, uh, uh, this condition. And treatment is generally divided into inpatient and outpatient uh, regimens. And we care mostly about the outpatient uh, uh, regimen, where we're giving patients a shot of subtraxone, and then they get two weeks worth of doxy. And uh, all guidelines seem to agree that you should be considering uh, two weeks worth of uh, metronidazole uh, in these patients as well. And me and Dr. Price have kind of gone through the guidelines to see when are indications for using metronidazole. And uh, some things like if patients have moderate to severe uh, uh, PID, but still warrant outpatient treatment, if they have uh, structural abnormalities such as an abnexal mass or abscess formation, um, or symptoms in keeping with DV or uh, trichomonas, then you could uh, also treat the patient with uh, metronidazole. Epididymitis uh, is a, another manifestation of these infections, and the guidelines seem to strat stratify patients based on the risk of whether or not uh, enteric pathogens are responsible for the infection or if STI pathogens are responsible. Um, and that age of uh, when things diverge seems to be around 35. Um, when you would be covering under 35, you'd be covering patients for uh, uh, chlamydia and gonorrhea with a dose of ceftriaxone and uh, uh, 10 days worth of doxycycline. Um, if uh, they're more at risk for enteric pathogens, then a fluoroquinolone can be used. And in the men who have sex with men population, you kind of split the difference and cover them for uh, both. I think it's prudent to take a, a good history uh, from your patient and kind of help risk stratify them yourself because just because somebody's under 35, or over 35 doesn't necessarily mean they fall nicely into one of these boxes. Disseminated gonococcal infection is worth mentioning. Thankfully, it's rare, but uh, it can happen in up to 3% of patients. And just to make it harder to diagnose in the emergency department, some patients will not have uh, kind of prodromal uh, uh, genital symptoms. The prototypical thing is the arthritis dermatitis uh, syndrome and up-to-date kind of lists the frequency of uh, symptoms there. And uh, it can be kind of tricky for us in the emergency department because a lot of these uh, symptoms overlap with probably more common um, uh, conditions that we'll see. Um, also important to note that you can get a, you know, a monoarticular septic arthritis from disseminated uh, uh, gonorrhea. And it's important to, to think about in those patients that might not have the traditional risk factors for a septic joint, but are coming in with a you know, red hot uh, uh, swollen knee. And these are just some good examples of the vesiculopapular rash that you can get with uh, a disseminated infection. Um, sometimes they're a little bit uh, hemorrhagic and they can be generalized, including the palms and soles. And now we'll just wrap up uh, talking about uh, these two SDIs, uh, lymphogranuloma and uh, syphilis, because both are on the rise in our community. LGB is quite uh, rare. Um, it's also caused by chlamydia trachomatis, but different serotypes or kind of subtypes of the uh, bacteria. Um, and its incidence is increasing in the men who have sex with men population. The primary infection of a kind of painless lesion or papule or sometimes a uh, painless ulcer um, can sometimes go unnoticed and patients will likely present with secondary infections such as inguinal lymphadenopathy, uh, rectal bleeding, um, and severe kind of proctitis sy symptoms, including uh, discharge and tenesmin. And there is an association with uh, HIV, and it um, not only makes patients more prone to spreading uh, the virus, but also more prone to um, becoming infected with the virus as well. <laughs>
we can consider this disease in the men who have sex with men population presenting with uh, uh, severe proctitis and rectal and genital swabs should be taken if you see somebody with significant lymphadenopathy, um, inguinal lymphadenopathy and rectal, uh, uh, rectal symptoms in keeping with proctitis. Public health will, did you? Yeah, I think you're gonna. Uh, so I, I was gonna say public health will um, run any swab, uh, any rectal swab that is positive for chlamydia and uh, send it to the national lab uh, for kind of subtyping or serotyping for uh, LGV specifically. And that will happen automatically um, as long as you properly label the swab as a, a rectal source. Um, and if it does come back positive for the LGV serotypes, then um, yeah, patients will need an extended course of doxycycline for three weeks. Is that what you're going to uh, mention, Dr. Devlin? Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So we'll end, uh, we'll end here with syphilis um, caused by uh, tropamina pallidum, this nasty little thing on the right here. Um, and it's been increasing in recent years. And it's often called the great imitator. I think of it as like the lupus of the sexually, uh, sexually transmitted infection world. Um, and we'll see why in a second. It's got an interesting kind of history. Uh, the first outbreak was described in Europe back in the 1400s, and there's competing theories as to whether or not syphilis was always in Europe or um, if it was a new world disease brought from the Americas by Columbus back to Europe. Um, Columbus's first voyage returned in 1493, so it does seem a little bit suspicious. Um, they used to call it the great pox, but the Italian poet wrote a poem called Syphilis or the French Disease, where a kind of shepherd boy named Syphilis uh, got smited by the gods with a uh, horrible pox. Um, and I guess the name was kind of stuck. Um, before that, like I mentioned, the Italians called it uh, the French disease, probably alluding to the fact that French soldiers seem to bring the, uh, uh, be associated with the outbreak. But the um, French called it the Italian disease. And this uh, Dutch called it the Spanish disease and the Russians called it the Polish disease. So I kind of found this interesting. I guess you kind of pick whatever country you hated and then attributed the syphilis to uh, and, and blame them for syphilis. And you can kind of draw modern parallels with that kind of ignorance to um, certain presidents of the United States or former presidents um, referencing the COVID-19 uh, origins. And this data is from public health. Again, you see the increasing incidence uh, of syphilis in our community, thankfully still quite low, um, but on the rise. Any age breakdown of, uh, of that uh, data shows that, again, still an infection of uh, younger people, um, but uh, has a bit of a wider distribution and can uh, affect older people as well. Syphilis so broken up, uh, I'm sure a lot of us know, primary, secondary, tertiary infections, as well as a latent stage as possible, with the primary infection being uh, heralded by kind of this painless uh, chancre that will heal on its own over three to six weeks, even without treatment. Um, and some patients get uh, uh, non-tender lymphadenopathy. And it's usually kind of a well kind of uh, demarcated uh, uh, ulcer that's usually kind of clean based and not super inflammatory looking. Every time you read about syphilis and this painless chancre that goes unnoticed, you kind of wonder how on earth that can go unnoticed and be painless, but I think that's what they say. And secondary syphilis, I think, is where uh, it gets its great, its great uh, name, the great imitator from. You can see kind of uh, what well, it'll pop, uh, secondary syphilis can happen a few weeks or months after that chancre appears and disappears, and patients are still infectious. Um, obviously, the rash is the most uh, kind of common or most obvious uh, symptom that we'll see in patients, but you can see in box one there, um, the kind of presentations patients can have with secondary syphilis. And I think with the exception of probably respiratory complaints and chest pain, that pretty much covers every emergency medicine uh, kind of presentation. So um, can be a very nebulous and difficult diagnosis for us to make unless that, you know, classic uh, rash is uh, uh, staring you in the face. And this is one of the kind of examples of the different morphology this rash can take. It can be usually generalized. You can get uh, mucosal um, kind of erosions and then uh, uh, papules on the hands. Sometimes it's a, a quite a dark or scaly uh, uh, rash as well. Tertiary syphilis, um, uh, thankfully quite rare, um, but it also doesn't require previous symptoms to make uh, diagnosis uh, even more difficult. Um, the hallmark by kind of uh, gamatous disease that you can get of the viscera, um, skin, bones, subcutaneous tissues. Uh, 
um, aortitis and aortic aneurysm is also um, possible. Uh, neurosyphilis can develop uh, at any stage uh, with the early neurosyphilis symptoms uh, sometimes being heralded by uh, kind of acute meningitis symptoms or even uh, just ocular complaints such as uh, a uveitis. Patients can be at risk for getting uh, kind of meningovascular disease and stroke. Um, and then late uh, neurosyphilis, uh, uh, thankfully very rare, but um, can cause something called uh, general paresis or general paresis of the insane. Um, and kind of reading about it sounds terrifying. Uh, you get uh, kind of apathy, impaired judgment, delusions, um, eventually you kind of get cerebral atrophy, which leads to wasting, cachexia. Um, and as one article put it, uh, eventually the paretic dies bedridden, cachectic, and completely disoriented, frequently in a state of status epilepticus. And the Wikipedia article said that uh, originally the cause was believed to be inherent weakness of character or constitution. So I thought it was probably just easier to be a doctor back then when you could blame uh, status epilepticus and uh, psychosis that the patient just has a weak constitution and there's nothing that we can give. And for those of us with the Royal College exam kind of looming in the uh, not so distant future, um, this is the uh, prototypical Argyle Robertson people of uh, neurosyphilis that is um, supposedly very specific to it. And I think we all carefully look for this in uh, all the patients that we assess. Uh, syphilis is uh, more straightforward to uh, test for in that we it's a serum test and sent for serum syphilis um, and run by the uh, public health lab. It's no longer that kind of VDRL assay that uh, uh, some of us may be more familiar with, but it still sends for treponemal and non-treponemal tests. The first test they'll do is an antibody test that detects um, IgG and IgM antibodies. And um, if nothing is detected, then the result is uh, reported as uh, syphilis not detected. If uh, those antibodies are positive, then um, it's sent for further testing where you get a non-treponemal antibody assay that may, uh, I think, result a uh, kind of a quantitative titer that can help uh, uh, kind of assess response to treatment and um, uh, the chronicity of the infection. And I believe uh, if you're sending CSF for syphilis, it's still uh, uh, done in the VDRL assay. And treatment options are listed here. Um, primary and secondary syphilis uh, kind of within our realm to uh, be using a, a single dose of long-acting penicillin G, um, IM, and then the other uh, kind of regimens there will be done with, uh, you know, a specialist consultation. So in summary, I know we kind of covered a whole bunch of stuff fairly quickly. Um, chlamydia and gonorrhea can be equivalently tested for in males with either a urine or urethral swell. Uh, females, uh, a self-administered vaginal swab is a uh, first-line test, um, but not available to us at LHSC at this moment. Um, uh, so when we're doing our endocervical swab, we should be making sure we're using proper technique. Um, and urine samples are considered a second-line testing treatment or testing uh, option for our patients. Uh, the CDC is recommending higher doses of ceftriaxone for the treatment of uh, isolated gonorrhea. Um, and recommending doxycycline over azithromycin for um, uh, empiric dual coverage treatment. Um, like Dr. Devlin mentioned, I think we need to carefully weigh the risks and benefits of, uh, of those two different regimens. Um, things like patient preference and their ability to afford and get a prescription filled and um, adherence is going to be kind of the main thing we should be uh, worried about. Um, and we should all maintain a high index of suspicion for PID. Uh, LGB can be considered in men who have sex with men, severe proctitis or adenopathy, um, and rectal and uh, genital swab should be taken. And syphilis is on the increase in our community uh, and should be considered, obviously, in somebody with an undiagnosed uh, genital lesion, uh, generalized rash, or uh, unexplained constitutional symptoms. And before I end, um, this is something we should all be aware of, is this great resource that we have in our community through the Middlesex London Health Unit. Um, and the services that they offer patients. So public health will be running all of the tests that we send them for any of these infections and be following up with patients if uh, their tests come back positive um, and do contact tracing as well. Um, but patients can also be referred to public health or they can self-refer um, for things like repeat screening or testing and they should be encouraged to do so. Um, they can be uh, 
referred to public health for uh, test of cure. Patients can get free uh, STI testing and treatment there. Um, pregnancy testing, low cost birth control options, IUD insertion, um, emergency contraceptives, and uh, uh, cervical cancer screening can be done at the public health unit as well. I've had a patient uh, in the emergency department request uh, a pap smear, and I don't think we even have uh, any of that stuff, let alone um, you know uh, an indication in the emergency department to do it. So um, be aware of this uh, resource for our patients uh, uh, and encourage them to utilize it if you see them with uh, an infection like this. And those are some of the references I used, and I'm happy to field any questions or comments. Nicely done, Brendan. Um, I wondered, does everybody who's suspected of having syphilis need a, a LP? Or uh, if not, uh, what are the indications for getting CSF on somebody suspected or, or diagnosed with uh, syphilis? Thanks, Roy. Um, so, no, I don't think we need to be doing LPs on patients that we suspect um, uh, having syphilis. Uh, you can send the serums uh, testing, certainly, but um, if they have signs or symptoms of neurosyphilis, then I think that'd be an indication. I'd be happy to defer to um, one of our infectious disease colleagues to see uh, what they were doing in terms of uh, uh, lumbar punctures for patients that uh, uh, have syphilis. But um, as far as my understanding is, no, I don't think we need to be routinely doing LPs. Um, I would agree with that, Brendan. Um, what I would say about LP, so um, when you suspect syphilis or you have a patient with a high risk uh, sexual behavior history, um, that you do be sensitive or you are sensitive to any neurologic symptoms. Um, and so we see a lot of ocular syphilis here in London, um, which we um, collaborate with the ophthalmologists quite a bit about. Um, that same goes for otic syphilis so that the patient may have tinnitus symptoms. So it, just to, to make sure that you're screening them for some of the, the symptoms that they may have in, in secondary syphilis. Um, typically we do lumbar punctures uh, if they have neurologic symptoms um, and or if they have HIV with a high RPR titer, which you guys wouldn't necessarily have up front if you're just suspecting syphilis. Um, so I would just uh, offer that if you, you do screen the patient for any neurologic symptoms um, and then uh, proceed to an LP if, if that's the case. Thanks a lot, Dr. Devlin. Brendan, it's Justin Yan here, and I apologize if I missed it because I was at another meeting and joined about 10, 15 minutes late, but it's sort of a technical question. I'm not sure if it's a, a bit of a silly question at all, but um, with our guidelines recommending I am ceftriaxone, um, if somebody has an IV already in situ and they're saying, can't I just get my antibiotics through the IV in terms of the ceftriaxone, do we need to change the dosing uh, that's a really good question, Justin. I never kind of came across that in um, the literature. All of the guidelines say uh, intramuscular is fine, and that's probably because most of these patients are being treated in, uh, you know, places that don't routinely require IV access on patients. Um, I wouldn't imagine so, but I'm going to have to defer this to one of our experts um, and see what they would recommend. Uh, that's a really good question and one that I don't know the exact answer to. I know for when we treat um, syphilis, we, we need to give IM and penicillin because it, it um, elutes over a longer period of time, so has a longer half-life. Um, Lise, do you know the answer to that? No, I don't actually. I think it would be fine because we use IV ceftriaxone to treat disseminated gonorrhea or gonococcal arthritis. Um, so I imagine it would be fine. I don't think it's like a depot, um, unlike the benzathine penicillin we use for syphilis. Um, but I'd have to look it up, to be honest. I've never gotten asked that question. Yeah, it's it's more of just a practical thing, right? So we'll often get see we'll often see patients who maybe the nurse has started an IV or put in a lock at triage, for instance, when they're doing blood work or what have you. And you know the que the question always arises in my mind that. You know, we're giving 250 IM, but then oftentimes for like urosepsis or something, we're giving a gram ceftriaxone IV. And I, I, never, I never know in those situations where there's an, already an IV, if I'm like, okay, can we just use the IV for the ceftriaxone if I should be giving a whole gram or if I should be giving a 250 dose or what have you. So um, it was just a, more of a practical question that I wasn't really sure about. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I, I'll ask our pharmacist and, and we can get back to you guys by email. Yeah, it's, it's probably quite a bit less painful actually to get an IV put in than to yeah. have two doses of IM ceftraxone. Yeah. Um, on that same train, I have another question about gonococcal stuff. So according to the SDI Canada app, which apparently is run by public health, um, one of the options that they provide, uh, so ceftriaxone obviously uh, is there, but for those who can't get IM if you're treating them as an outpatient is suffixine PO. Um, just wondering in terms of efficacy and treating that, is that something if we, if for whatever reason we needed to use that option, um, is that a no-no or are you guys good with that? Um, so Gary, when I was looking at the guidelines, um, I, I believe suffixing came up as a, um, an appropriate treatment regimen as well. Um, but obviously uh, focus kind of on ceftriaxone because it's what we have in the emergency department and um, uh, wouldn't require kind of outpatient uh, uh, prescriptions. Um, I'm not sure what uh, our infectious disease colleagues are doing um, and whether or not, you know, if patients can't get ceftriaxone, if they can safely get uh, cefixime. Yeah, I and, mean, uh, I this think brings up a few of the issues are that in pediatrics for us. That in the pediatric world, or that we still have the recommendation for suffixine because the issues are that of resistance in the pediatric world are so low that we still feel or that the suffixime or that is appropriate. And that's what most of the sexual assault centers or that in Canada still use for children. There's also a couple of issues in the prepubular or the non-sexually active kid that we should bring up because some of you are gonna be working with that population as well. Certainly we don't do speculum exams and don't do endocervical swabs. Certainly it's a problem. I don't know what Joe's does not having vaginal swabs for NAT testing in kids because that's the recommendation or that for prepubertal children and non-sexually active children in terms of doing these testing. One other issue comes up about NATs and that's the sensitivity of NATs, the specificity of NATs in the prepubertal population because the prevalence is so low in that population. There are questions in the literature about the specificity of NATs and in general, oftentimes, certainly in the sexual abuse group, we do not treat prepubertal children on the first assessment. After their assessment, we do a repeat testing for them. In the American literature, they recommend a second different NAT. In Ontario, that's not available. Thanks for those comments, David. It's good to um, have your um, insight. I, I forgot to mention that in my talk because uh, I think that is an important point is that in prepubertal um, and kind of peripubertal children, um, these are infections of the vulvovaginal area and not of uh, kind of the endocervix. And there's no need to be doing a spectrum exam uh, on those patients. Sorry, is the vaginal swab available in Peds Emerge? No, the vaginal swab isn't available in Peds Emerge either. And I'm not sure what the sexual assault center at Joe's does, whether they have it available there either. I doubt it. I do doubt it as well. I, I don't think so either, because at Urgent Care, uh, we call the lab at St. Joe's um, to ask about vaginal swabs, like if we were to use the same swab to do a uh, vaginal swab instead, and they said that's a no-go, so I, I don't think so. Um, can I add a few extra comments from the ID person's perspective? Please, yeah, that's why we have you here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, first of all, great, great presentation. Uh, thanks for doing that. Um, so as you all may know, uh, there's a lot of um, shortages right now of the Aptima. Um, and so we're having issues uh, even in our clinic where we screen a lot of patients for STIs um, and how to collect those swabs. Um, and so I don't know, I was hoping Mike could come to give us an update about Mike, Dr. Payne about uh, when those will be restocked, but certainly that's been an issue and I'm sure it's been an issue for you guys in Emerge as well. 
Um, what I would say is that you have any patient with high risk sexual behavior um, that they do be referred uh, to the sexual health clinic on MLHU so they can have Q3 monthly uh, screening. Uh, and that you guys are aware of PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, um, which there's a clinic both at MLHU and also we see those patients here in uh, our clinic at St. Joe's. Um, so uh, that just should be sort of something that you may talk about or offer to the patients. And that if someone does have high risk sexual behaviors that we're also sending HIV and syphilis testing uh, for those patients in addition to your gonorrhea and chlamydia screening, which I'm not sure if it's standard for you guys to do. And I'm just gonna share one piece of literature. Megan, you muted yourself. Um, I'm sharing just a, a link to a, a new um, piece of literature that was just published comparing azithro uh, versus doxy for rectal chl chlamydia. And uh, in this RCT, um, uh, doxy is uh, clearly uh, a superior treatment um, in that situation. Um, um, sorry, it is, um, it's just Michael Payne here. Sorry, I, I was double booked on a meeting. So I just, I didn't know if there's any questions from the lab. Sorry to, to jump in there at the end, Megan. Well, thanks for coming, Dr. Payne. I think, uh... And thanks for those comments, uh, Dr. Devlin. Uh, I think the only kind of question that uh, was still up in the air kind of from a microbiological or lab uh, standpoint was um, whether or not we'll be having access to uh, vaginal swabs or kind of the multi uh, the multi test swabs uh, at LHSC at some point. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up. And I, I was going to come to give a, an update to the group on that. So obviously the unisex endocervical swabs are um, on back order. They were actually used for COVID testing in the spring and for a period of time, and um, as well as their manufacturing capacity has been impacted for Hologic or Optima, who actually makes those swabs. So every every single center is dealing with these issues, even at the public health unit and our SDI clinics. So um, they are. It's going to be an issue with the unisex swabs for quite some time, uh, and the supply issue. I don't have a, a great line of sight on some new swabs on that, and even the urine collection kits are also of limited supply. But what I will say is that I've been working with HMMS on the multi-test swabs, and we will or soon or very soon have some uh, a supply of the multi-test swabs in-house. What's our line of sync going forward? So at what's the reliability of the supply? I don't know. So I can say that we have enough for the next month that will be coming in for the multi-test swabs, and we'll certainly work with the eMERGE group um, that will give you the ability to do a vaginal swab. They can also be used for rectal throat and even uh, urethra meatal swab as well. Um, so hopefully it'll give you some options and, and certainly uh, Dr. Bonnie and Dr. Devlin on there as well, like for some of the other ID clinics as well, they, they'll be made available. So I just got off the phone with them this morning about that. So I'm hopeful we can get that available to your group for testing. That's fantastic news. And Mike, can you comment on the Cifixine, like what you think about using Cifixine based? I think it's probably reasonable alternatives. Ceftriaxone probably should be first line. But if you, for instance, the patient's refusing parenteral treatment, um, the cefixime susceptibility seems to actually be improving in Ontario. I don't know if you could comment on that. Yeah, so I mean, what I would say is that um, the susceptibility has actually been better over the past few years with regards to that. The, the thing is though, is that with cefixime, there's pharmacokinetic and dynamic issues with that medication, particularly for throat and sometimes even for rectal um, GC, it, it hasn't been preferred, but for urethral sites, it actually performs reasonably well. I do use it for, as you said, patients who are refusing a parental injection. I would still consider ceftriaxone as the first line treatment. If someone gets oral cefixime, I personally, I would do a test to cure on that person um, just because it's not typically our first line agent. Um, but I wouldn't say that I certainly have used it for certain populations who for, for whatever reason are refusing an injection. Um, but I would just say that you can use it, but I would recommend a test secure and they could even get that with their family physician or with the health unit to go in and get that done. That's great, thank you. And maybe Dr. Payne could also comment, there was just a question that came up earlier about giving IV ceftriaxone to treat um, uh, gonorrhea and is that acceptable? Why do we have to use IM? Because a lot of our patients in eMERGE have IVs and it's a lot less painful. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a really good question. I have to say I've only ever given I am um, ceftriaxone. I'm not sure if it's a, I'd actually be interested to see what Dr. Devlin and Dr. Bondi think about that as well. Um, I, I personally have not used IV. I've only ever used I am. I'm not sure if they have used IV. I, I don't see kind of it being an issue from a, um, you know, from a drug perspective, but I maybe ask them, because they treat more inpatients that have IV access with, with SCIs? Yeah, we didn't know either. <laughs> okay. <that's> a... <laughs> well, okay. Well, there, well, there you go. I, I, yeah. I just thought we'd get your perspective too, since we weren't sure. So thank you. <laughs> all, all guidelines say intramuscular. So it, it's hard to know for a fact. I mean, I guess my default would be is that potentially you could use IV, but then again, it's not first line, like it's not listed as first line agent. And again, you may have to do a test here for that individual, but I, again, I, I don't know for sure. I, I've never done it myself. Okay, well, thanks everyone for the discussion and to our kind of uh, experts for joining us here. Um, unless there's any questions, I'm happy to end it there, but uh, uh, also happy to stick around if there's more questions. I think that's great. Thank you so much. Thanks to our guest speakers for coming in. Uh, yes, a big presenting. thanks to Dr. Devlin and Bondi and uh, Payne for joining us today. We really appreciate that. Thank you. Great job, Brennan. Thanks, guys.